All right. Well, it's um, has really been looking forward to this this con conversation, Roald, and um, I think I think one of the reasons, and I, I couldn't put my finger on it because you've you've done a lot in 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 life, right? You've you've done several books on poetry and plays, and and you've done your research and your teaching and your PBS series, and they all, I, I was trying to figure out what the connection was. And to me, it was that they all involve communication. They all involve communicating with other people in some way. Um, yes, that is, uh, I think one, one way to view the story. The other way is, um, Let's see, everything in the world for me began in college at Columbia and all of the interests in the arts and the humanities that I've had in poetry in Japanese culture, whatever I've done, art history, art, uh, they go back to a core curriculum at Columbia and a general education. And one way to describe what happened to me in college, as I, I've said a few times, uh, I worked up enough courage in my three years at Columbia to tell my parents I didn't want to be a doctor. And I didn't have enough courage to tell them that I wanted to be an art historian. Uh, that would have killed them. Yeah, uh, typical Jewish immigrant parents. Nothing special here about Jewish immigrant. It's the same with the children of your local Korean grocer. Yeah, I spent my time at Cornell telling those kids that it's all right if they don't become a doctor. Yeah, uh, but they can if they want to, of course. Chemistry but was a good compromise, right? Chemistry was a compromise, but it turned, and I didn't. Um, so I played with chemistry sets, and we can talk about my background in chemistry. They're especially important role were summer research jobs when I was in college at uh, various government institutions, National Bureau of Standards, Brookhaven Laboratory. Yeah. Uh, many young people are in these REU, Research Experience for Undergraduates programs. And I was in those, and they were very important because the courses were uh, in chemistry at Columbia were dull, not so for the courses in the humanities, but the summer research experience taught me what research was like. And even though I didn't work in any of the fields that I worked in, in the summers, it gave me an exposure to research. And that was very, very important. And it's what I advise all young people, college age who have a chemistry interest is to get as soon as possible into a research group and see the family structure of how science is done uh, rather than courses, because yeah. courses yeah. are courses are what we have and they're a way in. But uh, I didn't make up my mind totally about chemistry until three quarters of my way through a PhD in chemistry. Um, That's at Harvard, but, right? at Harvard, but um, I, chemistry did fill a middle, a middle ground, and it was right psychologically for me in the end. I didn't realize that in the beginning, but in the end, and I'll tell you why, um, because in chemistry, there is no, uh, certainty. Um, there is partial knowledge. Uh, and as, uh, it, this, this is what Primo Levi in his book, The Periodic Table, at one point writes at the end of his education in college, actually, he, um, he as, begins to ask questions like, where are the theorems of chemistry? Okay. And he's, he's, he doesn't find them. So he goes to work in a physics department and finds all the uncertainty in the world there once he gets into it. So uh, 
if you want certainty in your life, go into mathematics, right? not into chemistry. In chemistry, there are little pieces of the chemistry which are well understood and which form connections between facts and reactions. But there also are many things that you need to accept, perhaps memorize, and eventually you will find some thread of connection between them. But there is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, things are not exactly as according to any theory that you have, which could explain something. Though I have spent my life teaching people molecular orbital theory, little piecewise explanations, but I don't claim that I have the explanation of all of chemistry in it. I have pieces of it. Chemists are always trying to make predictions, right? Predict what happened, like Mendeleev tried to predict germanium, right? In the periodic table, and, and he did, um, he did. But I'll, and... I'll t yeah, he did, and that was a wonderful proof in a way because those predictions, the interpolated properties of several elements, uh, eventually, for instance, right. technetium was missing, gallium. There were some others, um, and he could from his ideas, extrapolate to what their properties would be. And he was pretty good at it. Yeah. But I just want to remind you that he did not predict nor interpolate nor, and even fought with all his might against the noble gases. Yeah. And here's the reason why it's important to see that. The noble gases come between the halogens, the column of the halogens, and that of the alkali metals. How do you interpolate between toxic gases like the halogens are and soft metals like the alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium are? you would not interpolate an unreactive gas mm -hmm. as the middle point between those things. There was nothing to interpolate on. Yeah. And he, hadn't, he didn't have the theoretical quantum mechanics to see that there was something like filling a P orbital right. that gave the noble gases their property and their inertness. But he, he fought it, he fought them. And uh, so it's not perfect. Yeah, I mean, I love if, the periodic. if you don't have that concept of that stable orbital and, and those P orbitals, like the concept that you would have this inert gas right next to a fluorine or a sodium would, would seem ludicrous. Yes. You know, and then in hindsight, once once he saw it, he probably was like, oh, I'm so dumb, you know. <laughs> yes, you have to keep an open mind. And it's also that the discoveries of the noble gases came from chemical left field, meaning they came from the physicists right. uh, who, who saw them in the spectra of the sun and stars. It's interesting, they could have come. And this, this is an interesting story. You know, argon is there in 1% of the atmosphere. Right. Analytical chemists can do an analysis to better than 1%. They could do it in better than 1% in Mendeleev's time, but they just missed the argon in the atmosphere. And it, they just divided the atmosphere. They knew there was water in the atmosphere. Right. They didn't yet know about trace things like carbon dioxide. That's another interesting story that's come to haunt us these days, the carbon dioxide. Right. But they could have analyzed the unreactive part of the atmosphere, meaning the part where nitrogen, which is nitrogen, and uh, could have found the one 80th 
uh, of the atmosphere of the night unreactive part to be a, a gas which was not nitrogen, but they didn't. It would have come, it would have come in a few years. And it's interesting that the world would have been different then. One would have reasoned, is there something like argon, but lighter? Um, right. And one might have gotten eventually the other noble gases. Do, do you think, speaking of noble gases, do you think there'll be a day, I don't know, maybe in my lifetime or my son's lifetime that we get close to running out of helium because it's not, it's a limited quantity, right? And it can escape. Yes. And uh, a little bit is made in radioactive decay whenever alpha particles are emitted, but not enough to be of any macroscopic value. It looks like um, we are potentially, we might run out of helium. Now, the um, saving grace, it's not a grace, is that the two most abundant elements in the universe are hydrogen and helium. Right. Nothing to do with what is the most abundant on the earth. But um, hydrogen, this has to do with nuclear burning and the reactions in the first moments of the existence of the universe. But there is a lot of helium out there. There is a lot of helium in the sun. And uh, I think we'll eventually find some ways to, if we run out of helium, this is far out and I don't know how to do it, but we'll be able to get some from the sun. Right, right. And that's not burnt. Um, I don't know how we'll do it, but uh, oops, I have to, I have an automatic light you thing have which goes on a motion detector and uh, that's why I have to go up. What do they say? Necessity is the mother of all invention. If, if you yes. really need something, there's a way. Um, yeah, you know, people always thought for a long time that the noble gases were inert, right? And then... Um, then they turned out to be somewhat reactive fairly recent in recent time, right? That krypton and xenon compounds were formed and studied. Yes. So, um, We actually knew all along there was some latent reactivity, but it was very, very low. Uh, for instance, uh, a proton reacts with a helium atom to give an H helium plus molecule, uh, which is actually fairly strongly bound. Uh, but these things only take place in a vacuum or in a molecular beam, not in any, uh, and you, you really, I can put it in chemical terms. Helium with its pair of electrons in a one S orbital, is such a lousy base that it takes a super acid like H plus in order to get at the electron density of that base. Whereas, so the proton affinity of helium is only about 400 kilojoules, if I remember per mole, right. but the proton affinity of ammonia is about 800 to 900. Kilojoules. Well, it's even a weaker base than ammonia. Oh, it's much weaker than it's ammonia. Weaker, it's, yeah. it's much, much and, weaker. And ammonia is uh, not and, a strong base. So th that's yeah. why. He, so and is helium is helium reactive as an acid? No, it's also a lousy acid. It's neither a good base nor a good acid, and that's why it's inert. Yeah. Um, We have other examples uh, in the world of, um, of things which are neither good acids nor bases and therefore are quite inert. Uh, one which is, um, some are the sort of thermodynamic sinks of this world, the things to which other things go. These are carbon dioxide and water. Right. Uh, though water though is, is to some is a, a, a bit of a base and a bit of an acid. We we see that in the 
autoionization of water. I mean, two waters giving H3O plus plus OH minus. Right. Or, uh, but CO2 is, is really not very good at reacting with anything. Methane is pretty unreactive, although, as everyone knows, when they light their gas stove, um, that methane burns. So in the presence of oxygen and a spark to set it off, and you need that spark, you get the reaction to CO2 and water, a downhill reaction. Yeah, there's, um, there's these thermo therm thermodynamic sinks, but it's, it's interesting how a lot of these molecules have an Achilles heel, right? Like it's unreactive in most situations, but yet, I mean, yes, some, it of, these, has. That's some right. of these platinum metals and rhenium and tungsten, like it won't react with anything, but then something like hydrogen peroxide will be its, its weak point. And a lot of catalysts right. like, they just never even try it. They're trying like the strongest acids in the world and nothing is penetrating this metal. And, um, and then yes. like hydrogen peroxide will do the job slowly, but. Yes, the same thing is true for instance, for gold. So gold is, uh, if one studies electrochemistry, one can see whatever the reasons are for theoretically that gold is something which um, is, is hard to oxidize. It's hard to yeah. remove the electrons from gold. But if you have the right put it weekend. <laughs> yeah. Gold wants to be gold with all of its electrons on there. And if you were to get, um, if you were to, to get gold three plus, it would easily get its electrons and go back to go gold. Back. Right. And it doesn't react with oxygen, which uh, is, reacts with most everything. So when you, when you open, when you open the tomb of Tutankhamen, or you open any old tomb with gold objects in it, those gold objects gleam exactly the way that they were on the day they were put into that tomb. There has been no oxidation. Whereas if you had a bronze or an iron sword, they would be corroded away. Uh, they would be reacting toward Fe3 plus, Fe2 plus. That's what rust is. Right. And um, oxides, hydroxides, they would react and there wouldn't be anything left after a thousand years. Wow. But gold persists. And this is one reason that I think people chose it as a plus it's, it's relative rarity. So there's another story here. If you, let's see, there are many elements that are much more expensive than gold. Right. And much rarer than gold. Yes, yeah, like rhodium. And that's right, rhodium is an interesting one because we found a use for it, even though it's rare in gold. So why not, if, if, if you have to realize that currency or value or to be used as a medium of exchange, the rarity or the price of the thing is not a sufficient criteria. It cannot be too cheap and it cannot be too expensive you need the right because right it has to be, it has to, plus it has to be tradable. So those gold coins that they look like gold was very important, but also that you could find some gold with some effort uh, was, was useful. Um, copper could be used, but copper is a little too, too common and a little yeah. too reactive. Um, it's, um, it's interesting that I'm not sure the history, maybe you know who first realized that aqua regia could dissolve gold, but um, very few people realize that it's that, that ligand bond with the four chlorides that really drives that, that reaction, yes. right? Um, right. 
uh, it's not the only thing that solubilizes gold. Uh, and the chlorides do it, also cyanide does it. Right. And much of the, um, much of the illegal mining of gold in South America and in Africa is a problem because it uses, uh, it uses, uh, well, that it uses mercury to get the gold out from oil. So that's another thing, um, mercury, commercial mining uses cyanide. Right. And so your, your question, uh, who originated aqua regia? I think it's not known. I think it was first used in medieval times and no doubt comes from the alchemists. It's something the alchemists gave us. Right. But because they were the ones who seemed to have made the, min the strong mineral acids in reasonably pure form, that is hydrochloric and nitric acids. Um, and it's that mixture that is, of course, aqua regia. Uh, so I think they got it, um, but I don't know who, I don't think it's known who exactly right. originated it. The, um, the idea that you have these, these, these ligands surrounding the gold, the cyanide or chloride molecules, that's, um, that's on a very small scale, but it also made me think about something else that you've talked about, which is nanoparticles and nanotechnology and, and that how, how the media portrays nanoparticles as these tiny, they're not, it's not powder, right? And it's not atoms, it's in the middle, but, um, but it's, it's um, why don't you explain why it's important that people understand how these nanoparticles can be stable, right? Like they need something around them to stabilize them. Yes, they do. And usually um, in the cartoons that people draw of nanoparticles, they don't draw the stuff around that stabilizes them. A nanoparticle of gold or of rhodium or that is a little cluster of 55 gold atoms without any ligands. What it wants to do and it will do is to go to gold metal, which is it'll, it'll go dimerize, back. it'll polymerize to the polymer. So what you need to do is to prevent it from doing so by providing on the outside of the gold particle, some ligands, um, usually Lewis bases, amines, carboxylates, uh, thiolates, things which coordinate and take up a little room and delimit access by other reagents to the gold particle. But most of all, they prevent the gold particles from coming close to each other. Okay. So very often the ligands have tails. Uh, the, the reason why they don't, they don't, people use sometimes x-rays to probe these, and those, uh, the x-rays they use are such that they, they don't see the, the, the tails of the bases that are around. It just shows so the metal, just, right? Just shows the metal part. It's like an x-ray and you, it's, it's, it's as if you tried to judge about a human being from seeing an x-ray from them. You think there is nothing there except the bones, but of course there is something there. Uh, it depends on, on what you use, what radiation you use. Yes, there are, the ligands are very important. The reason I'm bringing it up is because it's, it's a very hot topic when you go online and look at research and new companies and new funding, like everyone mentions nanoparticles, nanomaterials, and um, you know what, you, do you think it's 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 an exciting field of research research or is there a lot of hype you know is this being hyped up like how how far away do you think the commercialization is so i think nanoparticles is an interesting and important piece of research 
and it has an inordinate amount of hype on around it. But then I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical about the hype for anything. <laughs> uh, a fortunate thing is that the hype is cyclical. The internet is in desperate need of content, uh, preferably content that exaggerates things. And you could say uh, that it's it's a continuation of stories where first story is that uh, this is the cat's pajamas and it's better than anything else. And the next story is yes, but it has troubles like it's uh, toxic to fish or something like that. And so you get two stories on, and no progress. Uh, but in reality, the nanoparticles are a new way of manipulating things. And I think an aspect of interest with respect to students is that in the preparation of nanoparticles, and one can see they come in various shapes. They come in cubes, they come in concentric spheres, they come in tetrahedra in all kinds of shapes. Right. Those shapes are set in part, they're set in large part by the kinetics and the solvents that are used. That is how fast or slow you do this right. and what solvents you use what are the the ligands that you use? And the reason I mentioned this being of value to young people is there is great room for playing with those things. Right. That is, it's not something that's theoretically predetermined. One has to experiment and uh, in a laboratory with reasonable, with not too complicated equipment, it's possible to tinker with things like the shape of nanoparticles of something where the material is not harmful in some way, nor too expensive. Um, so I think this is an interesting, an interesting field. I tend to when I've sometimes judged science fairs, I tend to look for those projects where there is some, where those young people have, they haven't gone to some workshop which teaches them molecular biology techniques which are not accessible to anyone in the world except who has been through that workshop. And what I look is for something that's accessible to tinkering by a person on a pretty simple environment, because that's where one learns what science is like. One learns to do experiments. Isn't there um, someone you know doing some pretty amazing stuff at Columbia? Is it Jonathan Owen? Jonathan Owen is one of the very best people. We've tried to hire him at Cornell. We failed. Uh, I think he's one of the best people in this nanoparticle field. So you tried to hire him at Cornell. So yes. So the see you admit it, you did not retire in 2008. You're still working. I am working hard enough so that I don't I never can catch up. But I should retire and I have let go of some things. Um and I no longer have a research group. So the research group in science is the basic scientific family working unit. Right. Uh, it varies in size. It's made up of the professor, of course, but also of postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduates who join in the effort. So and the, these vary in size. Mine was typically from four to 10 people, aside from me. Some research groups go up to 50 in some organic chemistry groups um, and a few others. Uh, these groups meet, they talk to each other. I don't see how you can do it with 50 people, but, I, but with four to 10 people, we can oh. do it very well. It's in those research groups 
you, for instance, you try out talks, someone brings in something from the literature, either on a scheduled basis or spontaneously. Yeah. And someone brings in something and another person thinks of something related. A third person realizes that this is, this has been done before. It's in a, it's in the environment of a scientific research group that one learns value judgments about what is good science and what is routine science mm. and what is even poor science. And because that's how the world is. The world isn't all great science. Yeah, but um, if it is great science, your peers will recognize that pretty quickly, yes. right? Like immediately. That is recognized. Um, will the hype influence it? I think in general, not. Um, because it may influence to some, it will certainly influence what the journalists write about it and may influence some granting agencies though they're pretty smart, but it doesn't influence your colleagues um, because they know what's good yeah. or not. Do you still uh, work until 9, 9 p.m. every night? Or have you no, no longer, I, but I, I go home and I, I work at home some more. My wife thinks too much. Uh, I am, after all, 83 years old, so it, I've earned a retirement. I was at Cornell, I've been at Cornell for over 50 years, um, 55 years. Uh, anyway, I still work. Uh, I've always had several things I do outside writing outside of science, right. aside from the poetry in a place. Um, but um, there are essays that I write and there are a few books also that you've seen. Yep. And these have given a lot of satisfaction. Um, I'm still trying to write that a paper for my Columbia freshman writing seminar. Um, <laughs> I'm still trying. At, at Columbia, did you actually reread War and Peace or some earning, Ernest Hemingway uh, for a second time? I, I did, and they meant more, uh, War and Peace. I did reread books that I had read before, but at There's the difference between reading a, a novel at age, age 20, 20 and reading it at age 16. The difference is by age 20, you're likely to have fallen in love and fallen out of love. And then you, that novel means more to you. Right. Uh, right. Than it meant at age 16. Uh, so that there is uh, maturity does matter in these things. And to this day, I generally need read novels. Uh, right now, I'm uh, reading one. I've forgotten the writer's name, <laughs> um, but um, uh, it'll come back to me in a while, a long sure. kind of computer-based novel. Um, I really enjoyed recently the trilogy of books by Hilary Mantel about Thomas Cromwell in, in King Henry the Eighth time. So these were historical novels, but I also, I, I like just, uh, uh, I, I, I generally, I find novels to be, they give me, they're so original. They give me an idea of human character. It's, um, uh, it's, it's a lot of work to write a novel. Someone has put a lot of their life and thoughts exposed yes. to the world. Yes, I think uh, 
They're also a moral instrument that is they tell you how people behave, what are the consequences of different kinds of, right. of, of human actions. Um, they teach you ethics. Uh, of time to wait. Turn this on and again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're just wonderful. So when you read these books at 16, you hadn't maybe fallen. You probably fell in love first when you were 17. <laughs> I don't remember. And it's just the way of this is probably I'm going to guess this is the same girlfriend you did. Is it true you told a girlfriend when you were 17 you wanted to win the Nobel Prize? Yes, I was naive enough at 17 to do that. Um, and by the time I was 24, I knew that that's nothing you could work for. It's it's a it's a little bit of luck, right? Once you reach the top, there's so many yes. great works like that's how right. do you know? There are a number of different ways of saying it, Scott. Uh, there, at the top, you can work to be a good scientist, but as you work and with respect to the Nobel Prize, you realize that there are many people who who have done work good enough to deserve it, but only a limit of three, it seems, that are yeah. recognized. I can put it this way. Every year, the journalists come to me <laughs> and ask, who's going to win the Nobel Prize this year? I bet you're always as if, wrong. <laughs> as if I knew. So I, I give them a reasoning here. I, I have various kinds of, I've learned something. I have also friends on the Nobel Committee uh, and I have close ties to Sweden. And that's important because it's a bunch of Swedish scientists who right. decide. And your wife is um, Swedish, right? Yes. I know that they, the first thing they look at when someone's nominated is they look at who else has done something similar or who else okay. might deserve it. And they tend to recognize fields or subjects if they can. Yeah. And yeah. who has contributed to the discovery or establishment of a, a field. Okay. So, uh, for instance, I know, I feel it deep in my bones that bio-inorganic chemistry deserves a Nobel Prize. Right. So what I mean by the bio-inorganic are the chemistry of hemoglobin with an iron atom, of nitrogenase with molybdenum and iron atoms, of other enzymes which have copper and iron in them. And the action in these, and this has only been realized in the last, last 30 years, the action at the active site of these enzymes takes place at a metal center that is surrounded by protein, which provides the tuning and the access and the specificity. But it's the metal act that, sort of, that provides the reactivity. And then I think of the people who contributed to, the, to that. And one just died, Dick Holm. Another one just died, yeah. R.J.P. Williams. But Harry Gray um, and um, um, other people that I can think of still alive uh, can, are alive I think that would be a wonderful so I mentioned that okay I've mentioned that to journalists for 10 years I mentioned to them some other groups I'm sure that one will be given for instance on structured uh, uh, metal organic frameworks so-called MOFs which are like geometric constructions with a lot of space in them. And they were pioneered by uh, several people. And one of them is um, Jim Wiest in Canada, Omar Yagi in the United States. And uh, there is also a person in Australia who has worked on these. Anyway. I mentioned these to people, and what I want to tell you is I'm right about one out of 10 times. That's 
not bad. Okay. Not bad, but what does that tell you? Hoffman is not an idiot. He knows what is good in science. <laughs> and if he cannot guess the Nobel Prize. No one can. <laughs> and no one can. And most of the time, there is something special in the last years that they've given them often for molecular biology discoveries, yep. even though they're in chemistry. Chemists are sore about this because it's somehow, don't they have enough in medicine and physiology? Why do they need to go over into Steal our chemistry? prices? Yeah. And here, and we give it to physicists once in a while, like we gave it to Rutherford. Yep. And um, there was another instance, also Walter Cohn for uh, a way to calculate molecules. Anyway, um, there is, you cannot at the top level work toward this. It's a chance event. It's right. not political the way it is for peace. Uh, and often, and, and it's not too subjective. I have rarely seen a Nobel Science Prize awarded to someone who didn't deserve it. Right. Now, the work that you did, let me see if I can explain this correctly. Tell me if I'm right. Your, your work helped scientists predict which reactions would be easy and which reactions would be would be hard, specifically right. para, paracyclic reactions, right? Specifically Where organic reactions. Organic, organic reactions. And um, uh, certain reactions which run sort of in a topology of a circle, they go right. around the rim. For instance, four carbons getting together with two carbons to give a six carbon unit. So, that, uh, that is a common build, that's a common Lego building block yeah. strategy for forming rings in organic so molecules. Para, Paracyclic reactions, right? That's what they're called. Yeah. Is a uh, vitamin D synthesis uh, an example of that? In vitamin D synthesis, there arose a number of examples of these. Um, somewhere like a six-membered ring coming together, a six-membered chain coming together into a ring. And the specificity, this, the particular motions of the atoms as this took place formed some of the initial puzzle which Woodward saw, and he even saw a simple answer, but maybe he wasn't sure of himself. And he came to me and we were off and running because he came to the right person, someone who, who was just beginning to love organic chemistry. And we, anyway, yes, we, we did come up with a set of rules, but those rules were based on quantum mechanics, right. on the physics on the and electron. physical chemistry and on how the electrons were disposed in this chain or in the components that came together to give the ring. So we, um, yes, that's what we did. And we were, it was a, it was a lucky juncture of, lucky for me, a juncture of quantum mechanics and physical chemistry with organic chemistry. One way to say it is before we did this work, no organic chemist would know, would be expected to know any quantum mechanics. Right. After we did this work, they all every <laughs> organic chemist had to take some elementary uh, quantum chemistry, and they cursed us. I was about it. to say they curse you for sure. They curse you about it. <laughs> so, so no, but they saw it was beautiful. It was beautiful. How did they notify you when you won? Do they? Do you get a call on your phone and it says uh, <laughs> Nobel Prize committee's calling? 
How do you? Well, how did you get the news? The Nobel Prize, nineteen eighty one. There were yeah. no cell phones then. Was it uh, um, Pony Express? So they called. Uh, they called. But so that's the other thing I want to tell you, uh, Scott, and also to the, any young people listening to it. Uh, this. The Nobel Prize in science is never a surprise. It's a surprise only for journalists who create it as a surprise because that's what they think that people want. Right. Uh, why is it never a surprise? The reason is, is that we know, I told you about those group meetings. Yep. What goes on at those group meetings Within a year of when we did the work, which was 1965, yep. within a year, every group meeting in organic chemistry around the world talked about our work. Yeah, they were inviting you to conferences at Harvard. They were inviting right? me to conferences. I was getting awards. People were saying, this is Nobel quality work. But it wasn't the same about other things. What I just told you about bio and organic chemistry, yeah. that's not a secret. It's right. a it's this is very different from the Nobel Prize in Literature, yeah. where there is a lot of people and you who are eligible and you don't know. Uh, sometimes you can't even judge quality, but in this case, so Woodward and I knew that we were nominated for the Nobel Prize even though we only got, we got it, I got it uh, 1981, the work was 1964, 65, 16, 17 years. For 10 years, we were nominated for the Nobel Prize. Right. It was yeah. not a surprise. And it's exciting when you first learn. Uh, how do you know you're nominated? The Nobel Committee doesn't tell you, but your friends, yeah. the ones who are nominating you, they can't keep they it a secret. They can't keep it secret because they seal the records for fifty years, right? Like yes. you don't actually yes. get to read these uh, nominations. We don't. Uh, uh, very uh, soon, I will see who nominated us, <laughs> uh, because I've so long lived that there is a chance that I'll survive till uh, till uh, two thousand and thirty-one. You, you are living a good. You were one of. Hitler's gifts to America, right? That's what I say about it. It was no fun, uh, but no. uh, my childhood, but uh, I am a survivor of the Holocaust. You have a way of, of really seeing I the best. Survived, we survived, my mother and I. Many people in the family were killed. My father, three or four grandparents. Yeah. A typical situation for the Jews in Eastern Poland. My name, Hoffman, actually comes from some documents we bought at the end of the war. Uh, it was the name of a dead German. Yes. Safran um, is your, is your Safran original, was right? my original name. Original name. Um, my original name. And so I was born as Roel Safran. Um, Safran is a typical a Jewish name that actually crosses Sephardic Ashkenazi borders. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's not a common name, but it's 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 there. Um, our family was from Southeast Poland when I was born. Now it is in Ukraine, um, and we. I was born 1937. The war broke out 1939. And uh, the years from 41 to 44, when we were under Nazi occupation, was terrible yeah, because there was this occupation time. intent on killing us. And uh, it's hard to explain the obsessive anti Semitism in, to the extent of killing. Uh, harmless civilians, but that's what it was. And uh, so many people in the family died, but we survived. And 
we didn't get to America for another five years. So I have a lot in common, including the illegal immigration of having uh, come with false papers. Um, I, I'm not responsible, I was just a kid. Uh, but uh, I have subs much in common with other immigrants trying to right. get to America. And um, there's other things that they have in common. I go to the high school I went to in New York City, the science-oriented school, Stuyvesant High School. And I, I see these kids and now it's 80% not 80 percent, it's heavily Asian American, 60, 70 percent. And the, the intensity of the desire to learn and the untutored native um, intensity in the studying and the realization that an education is the way to advance is, is there in that Asian American immigrant population yeah. as yeah. there was in the Jewish American population of first and second generation survivors of World War II, which constituted a similar majority of that high school. Wow. It's interesting. And it's those immigrants, those immigrants have saved the New York City schools, uh, the Chinese, the children of Chinese and Russian and, and Korean immigrants have created a student body that is willing to learn that gives, that empowers the teachers who see this. Yeah. So this is very, very important. And also it's, it's interesting to see that there are, that different immigrant groups have different abilities to make use of what the educational system offers. Some are slow in our time. The Irish uh, perhaps were slower at getting into universities and such then, uh, then later the Koreans were. So there are different differences. There are different attitudes. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm very much an immigrant and very much a product of New York City schools, elementary schools and high school, then in college at the Columbia. So I'm still in New York. I was still in New York City. There's, and eventually um, I left. there's three elite scientific schools in, in New York City that you need to test into Stuyvesant and one of them is Brooklyn Brooklyn Tech, Tech. Uh, one of our um, one of our interns is a she's a, a high school student at Brooklyn Tech very young freshman or sophomore but she's really amazing does amazing work and and speed has an amazing education there um, I'm very impressed by what your students have done, Scott. Well, uh, well thank you. And, and they're gonna really love to hear that. They're gonna be, they're working, they're working really hard and they were really excited that I was, I was talking to you. They, um, you know, they really look up to you and your accomplishments and um, your hard work that you've done. And I think a lot of them hope have similar goals for their own life to, Yes. achieve and to be and to be good people just i would tell them to to be interested in everything uh, let the world flow into your mind when when they get to college if they are in high school now as some of them are uh, take that course in some strange field that you know nothing about uh, this is perhaps the only not the only, but it'll, it's a prime chance in your life to take that anthropology course and to, uh, or linguistics or a language that you haven't studied, um, or for that a matter, a course in how to grow grapes. Um, but the, uh, the opportunities, the world opens up. Yeah. Uh, 
the science the science will come right naturally right. often for for i suspect for these people it should be realized that the science does not come easily for some people in some fields uh, but the science and mathematics comes easily for you and uh, let the world flow in it i can tell you just from my example that i am sure that i became became a a more whole human being as a result of taking those courses in the arts and humanities yeah, at, at columbia that's when you did your literature courses and um that's when i've learned about poetry and poetry about art. You didn't actually get to write your first book of poetry until you were like 40, right? No, that's right. So I didn't write uh, when I was younger. Well, I think I tried, but I didn't. Let me just take a drink of water here. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I mean, you certainly made up for it since then. I mean, I've, I've looked at a lot of the books and poetries and seen people doing recitals. Um, well, I have read the writing, the poetry and plays and essays have been important to me. Uh, I didn't start again till I think midlife till 40 or so. Um, on, and then I gave those things more time. Um, everything takes a lot of time. And, and also I, I have a family, I'm proud of it. Today is my daughter's birthday, as it happens wow. to be. How many grand, we'll, grandkids do you have? We have uh, two children, my wife Eva and I, and between them, there are three grandchildren. They are all about the age of your interns. Uh, they okay. are uh, beginning of the university sort of end of high school um, and it's among them among the three grandchildren and the two children they took one chemistry course um, so something I didn't do a good job on which was to get them excited about chemistry but I did I, I actually both my son and my daughter uh, have worked in related fields. My daughter Ingrid has a PhD in physics, oh, wow. but she she is also uh, working now on outreach concerning climate change. Outreach means organizing museum exhibits, giving lectures, writing proposals yeah. that have to do with the science of climate change. She just wrote an uh, together with some other people, an award-winning book uh, uh, on teaching about climate change at the high school level, to give materials to high school teachers about that. And that book might be of interest to you. Yeah, uh, you must. There is a good bit of chemistry in it. You must be proud and of her. Yes, we are. So she has learned a lot of chemistry lately. <laughs> My son has also been a writer for National Geographic of, of natural, he no longer is at National Geographic, but he there, he built a journalism career in writing about natural history. So they both have, both of them have something to do with writing and something to do with science, but not specifically chemistry. Um, it's okay. It's just well, fine. You you forged your own path. It wasn't being a doctor like your parents wanted. Yes. And your kids have done the same thing. They've done their thing. I'm happy that uh, they have. When you, you mentioned your daughter, your, your daughter, right, has the degree in physics, the PhD yes. in physics. I was talking to a, um, a Nobel laureate in physics from Stanford. Professor Carl Weimer, Weimer, am I saying yes, yes, name correctly? You know him. I think I know. I know who he is. He's very interested in education. He is. That's why I yes. I attended one of his talks, and um, 
he's been a very big proponent of getting students in the classroom more active, um, yep. not just sitting in a lecture. And I, I, I told him I wanted to talk to him because this is very similar to our mission, Chem Talk. And without hesitation, he said, I refuse to get involved in anything involving chemistry because none of them, he didn't say none of them want to listen, but that was the, the gist of it. And um, I never got a chance to get the full story, but it sounds like he had some frustrations dealing he with must have had some chemistry that experience. community so, that experience. It's funny. So there is a story of in the 50 years ago, there were several programs to, to teach chemistry broadly and generally, and to improve teaching at the high school level. Uh, I've forgotten what the names of those programs were, but uh, I occasionally encounter older people who uh, had reasonable experiences with them. Most people don't have favorable impressions of their chemistry courses right. in high school uh, or later. So we have not done too well on we, the chemistry community <laughs> as a whole. Right. Now with all the media, all the things available to us. Yep, video games, TV. There is so much yeah. more to do, so much more that one could do. And uh, this is where the hope is on the young people working with you to whom yeah these, the social media and the platforms for exploiting visual images and the interaction of touch of and of vision and of numbers and of letters, these things together open up a new world, a new way of teaching. Yeah. Um, and that's what I like about what you're doing. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, those videos yeah. are, are very, very good. Well, thank you. And also learning how to make one of those videos, uh, thinking about how do I show this so that someone yeah. can get something out of it and think it through. Um, I mean, let me take a simple example. Right. One of the things that we every chemistry demonstration, every chemistry course has had is exploding a hydrogen balloon yep. or exploding a balloon, which is a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. It's spectacular, makes a bang. The more oxygen, uh, the bigger the bang, right? Yeah. Right. So that is done often and now, if for the young people, if they're watching this, I would like to, to ask them, well, I'd like to ask them a question, but uh, also I would like them to think about turning that, let's imagine they're filming an explosion. Right. There's a little problem with filming things that happen very fast, like an explosion. Yeah. So sometimes you can do slow motion, which is possible these days. But that's not what interests me. What interests me is, is the following. We, we justify after the fact, we, or sometimes we say before, but usually after the fact, we say there's a bang and a flame because a lot of energy is released when hydrogen reacts with oxygen, whether the oxygen's in the balloon or outside. When hydrogen reacts with oxygen, to make water, that's an exothermic reaction, gives off heat energy, and that's what the light and the heat are of the explosion. But what, what people usually don't do is they don't think about the fact that if they didn't bring a flame up or a spark up to that balloon, right. that balloon would sit there forever yeah or for a lot damn long time 
with nothing happening yeah. except maybe hydrogen actually diffusing out of the balloon. Right, it's, it's stable, uh, but, very stable. Well, so now you have part of a story. What does the word stable mean? It's not stable. It really wants. Is the water behind the dam want to be there? No, it wants to be <laughs> down the river and through the dam. Yeah, but it but the dam is in the way. Activated. And it can't penetrate. Activated. So the hydrogen and oxygen in a balloon really wants to be water. Right. Of course, a more stable anthropomorphism, state. but it's downhill for it to go to, to water. But it doesn't, the reaction has to be started, has to be initiated. A hole has to be made in the dam before the water flows through the, down to where it wants to be. Yeah. Uh, or the molecules have to climb over the equivalent of the dam, or the water can't climb over the dam, but actually molecules can overcome a barrier. Mm -hmm. so, the point I want to make is the absence of anything happening in that experiment is actually very instructive. Right. It means that many things that have, that are metastable, that are not really stable, like the H2 plus O2, like the right, water right. behind the dam, that many of these things have a barrier to doing what they, what thermodynamics or Wants tells to. them to do. Yeah, I, uh, that yeah. barrier is a fact of life in chemistry, That's and a, it's an important fact of life. And it's, let's see, what I'm trying to say is. Not only the balloon exploding gives you an opportunity to teach, but the balloon not exploding yeah. gives you an opportunity to I teach. I think that's a great example, and I, I need to incorporate that. The example I usually use is, a, and this is one of my favorite experiments, aluminum foil in water. Aluminum is one of the most reactive elements. It should displace hydrogen. In fact, Aluminum will displace hydrogen from water, but why is this aluminum foil not doing it? And I, people, the, the, the chemistry is actually very complex. And to this day, people are still understanding that passivation layer of aluminum oxide right. and how quickly it forms. Like you can't even scrape it away, right? Like right. It'll it's form. hard to scrape it away, yeah. But if you infuse gallium into the aluminum somehow, when you now put that aluminum in water, you generate copious amounts of hydrogen. It's amazing. Yep. Um, yes, the, the aluminum, and we cook in aluminum pots to this day, never worrying. And yet, if you put aluminum uh, in a, in a, uh, that experiment uh, where you mix in, aluminum with an iron oxide, uh, yeah. uh, then the, um, if you put, uh, yes, if you scratch the aluminum, even that doesn't do it. The oxide reforms pretty it quickly. It reforms at almost the speed of light. But, uh, but if you drop some mercury on, on the pot. Yeah, mercury or like gallium mercury. will do it then mercury actually removes that oxide layer or prevents it from forming. Yes. And then the aluminum. Aluminum is very reactive stuff. It's, it's the same when you drop aluminum foil into a solution of copper sulfate. There's no reaction. But if you have a small amount of chloride ions, and again, I've read a lot of research papers and no one agrees exactly why the chloride ions work. It yeah. allows the copper to somehow burrow in and react and you, it forms copper powder, you know, it, it literally a dash of salt. You just put a dash of salt and all the aluminum will convert to copper powder. 
Um, but like you said, the important part is showing it not reacting. It's like, why Yes, it should react, but why doesn't it react? And I think you're right in that that's a very great educational tool. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a big tool for the, the, the basic a fundamental curve yeah. in chemistry, which is that uh, things go have to go up before they go down. Uh, but, that's the activation energy. That curve is the yeah. strongest metaphor we have in chemistry. Those were those were two of the, the first videos I made was on gallium and aluminum and copper and aluminum. Great. That's great. Um, but you decided so, to, to teach, right? Sorry, I didn't go, go ahead. You yeah, I'm to just going to say we're going to have to stop in a little while because uh, in another 10 minutes or so. Yeah, it's just we know oh, where we're going. Yeah, that's good. To yes, know. what were you saying, Scott? You were saying something. Yeah, I uh, I probably have about eight hours more of questions. So yes. nothing in ten minutes is as good as any other time. Well, we can we'll we can talk another time. Uh, that's fine. That's but I think you have enough. I have, have enough, enough people to get an idea of my personality, <laughs> at least. Yeah. Um, I mean. Most, a lot of people who have these labs, right? You have a lab with postdocs and grad students and undergrads. I had one, I no longer had have one. one. I have stopped it now. That's just aging, retirement. A lot of people would just like to focus on their lab and grants and not teach, but you chose to teach the undergraduate course for half your well, time there, right? I had to teach, uh, we, we don't teach much. We're so lucky at major research universities that these like group meetings and such, in a sense, count as a course, as a seminar course. But uh, we have to teach one course other than that, typically. And on that, there is some choice. And it's that where I chose to teach introductory chemistry. And I must say, in the beginning, I was sort of set against it. I viewed it as onerous when the department chairman um, asked me to teach this introductory chemistry course. But once I taught it, and once I went through the work of trying to understand on a level that I could communicate to other people, actually turned out to be wonderful. I, I liked it. I liked the response from the students, which was always very variable. I mean, there were students who would fall asleep and there were students who were very <laughs> interested. That's just human nature. It's not me that they're falling asleep. Uh, sometimes right. it's, it's their life. Uh, but um, I enjoyed the art of teaching. I enjoyed the human contact. I enjoyed to see the light go on in the eyes of a few of the students. And also, I found that the teaching and the construction of explanations of as simple things as stoichiometry experiment and calculations, that the construction of the explanations put me in a frame of mind that improved my research, that somehow I was able to transfer something about the process. I think it's a, it's a transfer of empathy. That's a little hard to explain because it's convoluted. When I'm teaching, if it seems to me natural, though it doesn't always come to everyone, yeah. I'm trying to understand what the students in the audience, not every student, but some group in the middle, I'm trying to understand what they know and what they need to know and how I can best transmit this way of thinking. I am engaged in an act of judging empathy. That is, I, I try to get in their mind, right. of course. Right. Uh, how else can I judge whether what I'm saying makes sense except by being in their mind? Right. 
okay, when I'm writing a scientific paper, there are a hundred people around the world who read that paper carefully. They're usually graduate students somewhere. But you assigned don't know, to who, read you don't know who they are though. I mean, they could be- Don't know who they are. Can't grab them and tell them that's not what I meant. <laughs> it's all gotta be there in the words I use and the drawings yeah. I use. And something about the act of teaching beginning chemistry students, that act of empathy, I could carry over to writing my scientific papers, wow. even though a very different level. Yeah, so it made and your papers a lot more easy. I think it made my papers accessible in little ways. Wow. And I think people saw that. They saw that I cared. And so they read better. They read it more carefully. Oh, that's awesome. I like teaching. I, I really oh, it's wonderful. I enjoy it. I, um... So I miss that. I miss that when I don't do it now, but I give lectures. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just next week, I'm going to give a lecture in Stockholm, Sweden. It's about some physics and chemistry, about my research. And uh, it's teaching too. Well, I, I just have one last thing. We have uh, five minutes left. And one last thing I wanted to ask you about, maybe for me personally, one of the most important things because it has to do with one of the motivations for starting Chem Talk. And it's, it's about friendship and your friendship with Bassam Shakashiri and Oliver Sacks and how that got started. And, and I feel like you all have this common love for science yes. that just is so inspiring. Yes, so with, it's in different ways and there uh, that these interactions began. With Oliver, I had read one of his books, okay. uh, Awakenings, but um, I had, um, what happened was he actually wrote to me having read a book that I wrote in 1985 or so, or 87, uh, called uh, Chemistry Imagined. And he gave me some very nice comments from which I could see he was in love with chemistry. Yeah. And he sent me along an article that he had written for New York Review of Books about a biography of Humphrey Davy, right. the great English chemist. Oh, yeah. And I found some mistakes in this article and I pointed it out to him and it was time to correct them still. And so that began a correspondence and then eventually uh, as I came to New York, I met him and we, I could see at that point, the great love that he had for chemistry. Yeah. It was a chemistry, which was not my chemistry in a way, in a sense, because I'm in the chemistry of molecules, six membered rings coming together with two carbons. He was on the chemistry of substances yeah. of the elements of their reactions with each other, but there was this love in him. And so one time he talked about his uncle Tungsten and I, I spotted as our chemistry museum we had was being disassembled, I started, I spotted two bars of tungsten, I sent them to Oliver and that called up in his mind much more, which became then the book Uncle Tungsten. Right. But we became yeah. friends. Uh, and Bassam, we had a, I could sense Bassam's deep commitment to teaching and to yeah. chemical education. And those, those books of demonstrations of which you have uh, are just amazing. Uh, they're incredible. And uh, I could sense that. I also, somehow there was a personal bond because Bassam was very close to his parents, his father and mother, who yeah. were immigrants yeah. to the United States. And so was I. Uh, and I was close to my mother. And somehow there was a period when we were both taking care of our parents. And 
uh, that form the bond between us as well. So personal yeah. things yeah. matter a lot. Yeah. And yeah. I have remained uh, a friend and an advisor to Basam and he to me. Uh, and Oliver, unfortunately, is no longer with us. Right. Uh, a great loss. A wonderful human being. Yes, uh, Oliver, care <laughs> in his wallet, where most people have a driving license, he has a periodic table. Right. So it, it's it's so it was so close to his heart. Uh, yeah. The elements. I uh, I I wish I could have met him, but um, yes. I uh, yes. I always will think of him, and uh, I I can. Hopefully soon, I want to have some some tungsten, and it's going to sit on my desk, and I'm just going to think, of, think of his childhood. Yeah, yeah. Think of think of him, and um, when when Bassam sent me those books, similar to how when you sent Oliver that tungsten, you know, it really it meant a lot, and it made me wonder if um, you know I could really help do more. Um, to show people how how amazing chemistry really is. Um, I really saw how passionate about a Bassam was and that some, some of that rubbed off. So yes. well, um, Rod, it's it's uh, it's really been great talking yes. to you and it's good um, to talk to you. I wish you well and especially the young students and interns working with you. Their excitement for chemistry just trans is transmitted in their work. I love to see what they've done. Thanks so much. I well, they're going to be they're going to be glad to hear that, and um, and we'll stay in touch. Yes, so, let's stay in touch. Okay, time. bye bye. Okay, thanks for all. Bye. Stay see well. You.